Welcome to God of Work. This is Will Sanchez. Thank you for tuning in. This is a very special episode of Gotta Run. We are honoring the memory of Sean Kimmeling. Sean passed away from testicular cancer at the age of 37. That was 15 years ago. My guests tonight are Irvine Kimmeling, Sean's mom, a co-founder of Running of the Balls, and a survivor of testicular cancer, Freddie Kimball. I'm honored to have these two guests. Thank you. Let's start introducing, you're the mom, introducing the mom. Sean to our audience. Mm -hmm. What kind of a little boy was he? <laughs> Sean, of course, every mother thinks their child is the outstanding child, <laughs> but Sean really was. <laughs> He was adorable. I mean, Sean was, had charisma from when he was a little boy, and he was a devil. Uh, I remember the first time I took him out on a little tricycle, and there were three steps, and he decided to ride his tricycle down the steps. Well, that was kind of the story of his life. He was always doing things that were fun, that were kind of pushing the edge a little bit. He was a lovely person. You know, he's a, he's a very handsome guy, and people often say to me, Sean is so handsome, I, uh, and I say to them, uh, he was as beautiful inside as he is outside. Wow. Where was he born? He was born in Queens. Queens boy. Queens boy. Um, Where did he go to school? But uh, we moved to Westchester, uh, and he grew up in Croton, New York. He went to elementary, middle, and high school there. He was voted the best looking in his senior year of high school. And Isn't that embarrassing? <laughs> You never think of your kid that way. You know, I was really surprised. He was just my son. Uh, he was also very smart. He did very well. He and his friend Rob Seaver, who has been like a brother to him. They were brothers, and Rob has worked with us on the foundation for all these years. He got an Athlete Scholar Award in high school mm -hmm. and went to Colgate University for one year in which he wrote a sports column called Ling's Line. And when I look at it now, it was very professional. He was always a good writer. In high school, he would have a paper due, and he'd pull pieces of little, little pieces of paper out of his pocket. And the next thing I knew the next morning, there was a beautiful paper there written. He was a wonderful writer. So he went to Colgate for a year, and then he transferred to Georgetown. He graduated from Georgetown. Uh, ninth in his class, magna cum laude. In what field? In political science. Interesting. And then he called me and said, Mom, I'm not going for a job. A lot of recruiters are here, and he could have gotten at that time, you know, a very good job. He said, I'm, I want to be a, a sports journalist, a sports broadcaster. And he went to Hawaii for a year. He did all kinds of things like that. And then he, uh, he went to USC on partial scholarship as a, in broadcasting communications. And then he loaded up his car with tapes, audition tapes and actually went cross country, stopping in tiny little towns, wherever he could stop, big cities, little towns, wherever he could get in, left his audition tape, and he ended up with a job in a little town of Texas. When his friends came to visit him, he was the whole caboodle there. When his friends came to vis visit him, he would interview them, like New York people. He had the camera, he had, I mean, he just did everything there. But it was right across the border from Oklahoma, and um, he was seen, Oklahoma is a very big sports market, uh -huh. and he was seen uh, in Oklahoma, and he was recruited to come to Oklahoma, which um, he loved. Um, and then from there, he came to New York to Pix 11, and he was the weekend sports, sports anchor, Sean Kimberly. Sean, welcome. What do you have for us tonight? Well, they must have known I was coming home to New York because a uh, good day for the local team. He did stories during the week, and he did the pregame show for the Mets with wow. Tom Seaver. PIX, that's a big, that's a big time in New York. Yes, yes, and he, um, my kids were always Mets fans. If the Mets were winning and I was in the basement, I had to stay in the basement. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, that magical kind of thing. Uh -huh. And my son Josh is a Mets fan. He has two uh, siblings, a younger brother and a younger sister. Yes. Josh and? Josh and Amy. Amy. Yeah. Okay, and, um, so here's Sean. He's doing great at PIX great. 11, Channel 11. Mm -hmm. 
interviewing the Mets with Tom Seaver. Wow, that's a green job. All his job. old heroes, right. All and then what heroes. age was he at that time? He was, well, he died at 37. He was in New York for five years. So, okay, so he came into town at 32? Yeah. Okay. All right. He was always athletically, looked great, but there was a hidden disease. Yes. What happened? Yes, he was always an athlete. He, he went to the gym. He lifted weights. He was very conscious of eating healthy. I mean, all of that. So uh, he actually felt something in his testicles about 15 months before he was diagnosed and went to a local internist, just a regular doctor, had a sonogram, and the doctor said there's nothing there. Unfortunately, he didn't go to a urologist who was a specialist in testicular cancer, and he, he let it go. He didn't even tell us. I mean, he was a man, you know, in his 30s. And then over the next couple of years, he had back pain. Oh, well, over the next 15 months, he had back pain. He had had back pain before from, from playing golf, from other sports injuries, and he assumed that's what it was. And actually, if testicular cancer gets a little more advanced, um, back pain is one of the symptoms, and we never knew it. The other thing is that one of the things that sometimes is associated with testicular cancer is an undistended testicle. And Sean did have that, an undistended testicle. What is that? It's a testicle that does not um, come down when you're a child. And um, now they do operations with kids because they know this can be a problem, and they correct it when they're babies. But when he was born, they did not. And I think the connection between testicular cancer and undescended testicle was not really known. It was just starting to, they were just starting to think there was some connection. Okay. So once the doctor mentioned something to us about it when he was a teenager and didn't, didn't suggest we correct it, didn't suggest we go to urologist, and it was so casual that we just didn't follow up on it. The doctor said his testicles no, weren't... The, I, I knew from when he was a baby that he had an undistended testicle. Okay. And um, the doctor said, oh, I was reading a journal. There may be some connection between testicular cancer. And, you know, we kind of thought, well, if he has pain or he has, you know... And this is when he was a teenager. This is when he was a teenager, right. So, so there were warning signs. Yeah. And, okay. If we had only known them. Okay, so, but that's why... You eventually you found it the foundation to make people aware so it, of these warning signs, these right, dots to right. connect. The thing about testicular cancer, and Sean said he wanted to do something when he was in the hospital, and we're really fulfilling his wish. He was going to make this his cause. He was going to get out there. He would have had a great platform, of course. Testicular cancer, one, it's the highest cancer in young men, 15 to 40. So it can hit you very young. There, you, you're vulnerable if you're between 15 and 40, although it can uh, occur in people older. It also has a, a very high cure rate. Up if to, caught early, obviously. It has a 95% cure rate overall, even if, if caught a little bit later. Okay. But if you, the early you catch it, the less aggressive treatment, the less serious operations. You'll hear from Freddie about what he went through. Okay. So. We have survivors that work with us that have had a testicle removed and then had nothing, or had a testicle removed and had some radiation, but um, nothing else. So okay. you want to catch it as early as you can so that uh, you have the least aggressive treatment okay. possible and be highly, highly curable. Okay. All right. Now, before waiting for a lower back pain, yeah. What should young men be doing to help themselves? Right. Can they check them? <laughs> yes, they can check them. That's one of our mottos. Our mantra is check them. So we have a shower card that we make available for free. Like women examine their breasts in the shower, men should examine their testicles. And we'll make that available. And we send them out to high schools and colleges and, and health fairs. So This is a testis, better known as a testicle. That granular lump in the center is testicular cancer, the most common cancer found in young men today. It generally strikes men aged 15 to 40. You should check your testicles for any changes at least once a month. Carefully examine them for any lumps or abnormalities. Gently place your thumb on the front side of your testis with the index and middle finger behind it. 
Then, slowly roll it between your thumb and fingers. Feel for any small, hard lumps or bumps on the testicle. If you feel any abnormalities, lumps or swelling, a pain in the groin or lower back, contact your doctor immediately. Only a doctor can make an accurate diagnosis. The minute there's anything, you go and check it out. Probably a lot of times it will be nothing. But this is no time for being quiet and being like thinking you're invulnerable, right? Well, men are notorious for waiting, waiting too long to go to the doctor, right. whether it's the dentist, whether it's the skin right. doctor. I had dentists, I had skin doctors, and their common thing is men wait right. until it's um, a little more advanced. And then for cancer, the next thing you want to hear, if, you, if you're going to hear you have cancer, the next thing you want to hear is, and we caught it early right. because he said 98%, 99%, and the overall is 95%. It's a it's very treatable it's disease. Very treatable. And we're a small foundation. That's why we dedicate ourselves to awareness. You raise awareness, you have a good chance of a Okay. Cure. So what's the name of this race? I think it's called Running of the Balls? Running of the Balls, yes. So we started the Running of the Balls. Last year was our sixth year. We do it, New York City Runs produces it. Great organization. Yes, and it's been a great partnership. And this year we're looking at a possibility of Governor's Island for this race, which I'm very excited about. I haven't been there yet uh, since they started the ferry service. But um, we, we uh, try to uh, engage these young men with a reverence, with humor. If people go on our website, there's very funny videos. There's a, a giant pair of testicles skating. And I mean, just we try to really engage people with humor. So the running of the ball is a great title. I used to have a hard time saying it. You know, I go into a running store and say, I want to give you some flyers for the running of the balls, and they look at me. <laughs> but I can say it now, yes. And people love the name, and it's a fun race, and we've been very successful. Last year, we had over 900 people registered, uh, almost 800 people that completed it. And we love that it. On Roosevelt Island. On Roosevelt Island. Now, Roosevelt Island may not be doing races. We were, didn't get a permit yet. We used, we used to do it in June, every year in June around Father's Day. It's a great oh, Father's, Father's Day. Yeah. yeah, Father's Day race. So I think we're going to be in August in Governor's Island this year. And we started a second running of the balls in Washington, D.C. Sean went to Georgetown University, and we thought that would be good. Oh. Great. Second uh, spot to do it. That's going to be in September, the end of September, 28th. Oh, for, for 2019. For 2019. So you got yes. the Washington settled in. September 28th in Washington, and hopefully August 10th. We're just finalizing the details. Okay. And well, with Steve Lasto of New York City runs on, on the case, it, he will make it happen somehow. All right. Well, let's. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, but let's turn over to, to Freddie. Freddie Kimmel. Yes. I love that name. <laughs> Freddy, set, go. I've been watching some of your YouTube videos. So you are a transformational coach and a health coach. Mm -hmm. So that's your passion? Yeah, yeah. I'm very passionate about, um, you know, helping people manage their way through chronic illness, chronic disease. It was something I... I had to put my body back together after testicular cancer and about five surgeries and chemotherapy and my immune system shut down. So I, I really, um, I always wanted this guide to show up with all this information and paint a path that was very simple for me. And I never found that. So the website was born out of, I'm going to do that for somebody else. So you created your own job. I did, yeah. Tell us, you know, how did it, how did it happen and how did you discover it? Was, it? was it quick or was it, you know, what was the story behind it? Sure, so I was working, my other life is a Broadway performer, a music theater performer here in the city. So I was working in a show and I was playing a, a, a character that wore, wore very small, um, uh, very small underwear. It was a production of the Full Monty and I started to have pain in my left testicle. And I figured it was related to the costume. It made sense. Because it was a tight. Uh, it was a tight costume, yeah. So uh, I went and saw a doctor. And the doctor had told me that because it hurt, that it wasn't cancer, that cancer is a normal cell now, that reproduces kind of at a normal rate. I just went and saw, I went to a clinic. It was pretty much a walk-in clinic, yeah. I, I don't want to name the clinic because okay. <laughs> I feel bad. Yeah. But, um, you know, he, he told me 
that cancer didn't hurt and that cancer is really a normal cell, it just grows faster, which is true, but if you have a cell multiplying very quickly in a sensitive area, of course you're gonna have pain. So I left it, I probably left it for three, three and a half months. Okay, how long ago was that? That was 2006 when I went to that doctor and then it was probably three or four months later that I finally went to the emergency room because I got to the point where I could barely stand up or walk straight. You know, I was just hunched over, you, horrible, pain and abdominal where? pain, abdominal pain. And that's because it had metastasized to my lymph nodes, um, wrapped around the kidney, um, uh, vena cava running to the okay, heart. Okay, you it was, were hurting. I was shape. hurting, I was hurting, but you know, I was 28 and, and like we said, at that age, it is the last thing you think about. So I was just, you know, pushing through and eating Advil. Just I th literally thinking in my head that, oh, I had worked out too hard or I'm just pushing it. But never in a million years did I think that something like testicular cancer was happening in my body. Okay, so yeah. obviously you got the diagnosis. How, uh -huh. was, how was it broken to you? It sounds like the doctors here aren't, ooh, aren't doing too well in terms uh. of, uh, <laughs> of uh, giving you good information and, and taking some proactive uh, methods. So right on. did you have a positive, well, in terms of, of your experience with doctors, how was that? Well, the, me learning that I had cancer was, was very dramatic in the true sense of any Broadway show. You know, I was sitting in a waiting room after diagnostic testing and ultrasounds and urology departments and emergency rooms, and a doctor had walked in with about 11 um, med students and turned his back to me and started to say, this is a male with advanced testicular uh -huh. cancer. So that is how I heard, and I just, you know, I just, it, the lights, the lights, the lights went out. It was just like a, two minutes of me just kind of spinning, and, you know, I, 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 I got my senses, and I quickly got on a plane and went home, and, and you know, to the University of Rochester, Rochester Medical Center in Rochester. Because your family was there. My family lived there, and I just, you know, I knew, um, I was I was done with New York City hospitals at that point. I was like, oh, blame I, was, you. I was ready to go and just be with my family. And I made the right choice. Amazing hospital, amazing cancer center. Tom Golisano, the Golisano Children's Hospital, is there. So I was just in like four star care service, beautiful doctors, um, and I went right into treatment when I got off the plane. Okay. Now, you, this is late stage cancer. Mm -hmm. So what's the operation like? What, what are the procedures? Did you, did you lose your testicle? So the first thing they do, usually in testicular cancer, is they remove the primary tumor. And they're gonna remove that tumor, and what they're gonna do is they're gonna see what happens to the markers in your blood, because that tumor is producing uh, usually like a protein or a hormone, often very similar to a hormone, um, I think it's HCG, that a woman makes when she's pregnant. Um, a testicular cancer, if it's of the right cellular makeup, is going to produce that hormone or a protein, alpha theta protein, and they look at those levels to see if they drop or they go up when they bring out the primary tumor. When we took out my primary tumor, waited two weeks, and the levels kept, they, now they really started to go up. So we knew that this was an aggressive growing cancer that had metastasized to another part of the body. And so they, that's usually what happens, and then they can either, um, you know, there's eight different ways this could go. It really depends on your cancer and your body. You know, my path was um, chemo. They said we're gonna do four rounds of chemo, which is primarily all they do. That's the most they do for testicular cancer. But they, because it is fast growing, they hit hard, usually like five hours a day, five times a week, and then you get two weeks off to recuperate, then you start another round. Okay. And I completed the chemotherapy. And the funny thing about testicular cancer is, the chemotherapy drugs that they use are very, very effective. Uh, it's atopicide and cisplatin for most types of the cancer. And two things happen. Um, that tumor either evaporates, it's gone, or it burns it down like a marshmallow. Like it, it, it almost looks like a marshmallow in the body. So um, you're gonna see it on a CAT scan after your chemotherapy or you're not. Now is the tumor on this testicle itself, right? No, the testicle's gone, so we're looking at tumors in the peritoneum cavity and oh. the lymph nodes. So it usually goes, testicular cancer goes from the testicles to the lymphatics, the lymphatic um, nodules in the abdomen, and then it usually goes to lungs, and then it's gonna go to brain. A classic example of somebody everybody might have heard of that's very famous is Lance Armstrong. That's the progression of his um, cancer. And we all know he survived to be a uh, world champion in the, in the, on the bike. <laughs> yes, he did, yes, he did. <laughs> but Freddie, you're not painting a pretty picture here of, uh, you obviously were going through agony. You were fortunate that your family was close by, but I would imagine 
that emotionally you must have been a wreck. So how did you keep your spirits? How did you keep your mental facilities from going crazy? I think that's probably just genetics and disposition. You know, I'm a very positive person. I I was I was had just been cast in a big show, a Broadway bound show, um, my first that was that was going to go to the, you know, a great it was going they was actually going to start in D.C. at the Kennedy Center, and I was mm -hmm. so excited. So for me, uh, week one was just heartbreaks. I did not want to lose that job. You know how w hard you work as an actor to get those get those roles that pay you good money. And uh, that was the hardest thing. But once I accepted that that was the path, I was in it. I was in it to win it. You know, I was going to be the best cancer warrior I absolutely could. And just. So you, you said to yourself, I'm going to be the best patient, the best cancer. Mm -hmm. I like that term, cancer warrior yeah. that you could be. That was a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. Didn't necessarily come from prayer. You were something you were. You said it was it was your makeup, the way you were raised. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, everybody prays in their own way. You know, you have moments of reverence where you just, it could be putting your hand on your heart and just trying to listen to that that voice in your body that's that's connected with something bigger than you. Okay. You know, but but just really, yeah. And 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 that had evolved. You know, I would say post treatment and post cancer, my connection with um, the earth and spirituality and a higher power has just grown and grown and grown. Okay, and, and then yeah. because of that experience, you, you also, besides being a Broadway star or Broadway <laughs> actor. We'll, we'll call, yeah, well, well, let's you, just say you, actor. You wanted to help others do your transformational mm -hmm. work, do your health. So you offer services of, uh, you know, in terms of diets and exercise and, and well, positivity? Know, I'm, I'm really, yeah, really a coach. You know, I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian, although I'm very, you know, extensively well-read and studied and been certified as a functional health coach for the Institute of Functional Health Coaching and a Reiki healer because I believe in energy work and a positivity coach and, you know, um, the power of words, how we construct our own reality through the words we use, right down to the little pronouns and verbs. It all matters, every single word, okay. how clear we are with our text. Okay. But to be able to paint a path for somebody, you know, yes, very, very passionate about that. And then <clears throat> very passionate about patient advocacy and, you know, the perfect story with testicular cancer is you could go um, like we heard, you would go and you could have a surgery and you could remove that tumor and you could be done. You could be done. That's magical to my ears. Yeah. So I had, I had hmm. probably five or six surgeries from 2006 to 2015. Um, just taking out additional scar tissue. I lost a couple feet of intestine. So the surgeries from testicular cancer, specifically there's a surgery called a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. It's called an RPLND. Well, say that fast five times. <laughs> Retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, and it's it's a very invasive surgery. You know, it's 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 going it's going uh, pelvis to sternum and taking out all the organs in the peritoneum and then putting everything back. So, you know, it's not going to go back in like God put it in there or whoever. All right, but you, but you're looking very healthy. I mean, looking at you now, we never would have guessed, <laughs> you know, you're walking around with one testicle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it sounds like you're still performing Broadway shows. I just did a show up in Boston, and then I did, I worked on Cagney the Musical here off Broadway, which is going to go to Broadway in 2020. You know, yeah, very active, lots of energy, lots of passion. So. Okay, so before the cancer yeah. and after, are, it sounds, are you a better person now than you were before the cancer? Oh, Could I'm you a, say that? Yes, I'm a hundred times the person I would have been um, with with cancer in my life. You know, it really multiplied everything. Interesting. Yeah. Obviously, you, you didn't, wouldn't wish that on anybody, but I've, I've heard other mm -hmm. survivors mm -hmm. say that the disease, whatever it was, turned out to be a gift because their lives mm -hmm. were that much better after because they discovered strength within themselves they didn't know they had. Mm -hmm. And they used that not only to, you know, transform yes, their yes. lives in different ways, but to help mm. others, which yeah. is the beautiful yeah. thing. And that's what you're doing. Yeah. And that's what you're doing with the, uh, mm. with the race. Yeah, thank you. Um, and the foundation. So, but I, I want to say something about, um, you know, young, when young men get diagnosed with cancer, even if it's 
qu quickly, and they're the lucky ones, you know, fairly quickly curable, it's devastating because you don't expect, you, feel, you don't expect to get that kind of diagnosis. We have a number of young men who, who work with us with our foundation, they're TC survivors, um, and, and people want to do something and give back, you know, and it also is very, it, it helps to have a, a group of people who say you're gonna get through this and here's something you can do with the, with the fear, with the energy, turn it into something okay. positive. So we have Brian Harrington, survivor, who goes and speaks to students in a high school, and Todd Rosenbluth, who, who will go out and be interviewed and really speak about testicular cancer. Do you do some of that? Try to go out and uh, speak to groups about awareness. Of I, I do, yeah. I do a lot of public speaking, and I, and as I mentioned, it's a, it's a, it's a very common topic for content I'll create on social media or YouTube. I'll often go to, you know, cancer and you know these topics of chronic il illness. How we find ourselves there in this okay. modern world that we've designed. Okay. Well, this is a, a running show. Mm -hmm. We talk about the running culture. And one of the mantras that runners all hear about is, listen to your body. And, and it's a second part to it that sometimes we miss. Listen to your body, and if you don't understand what it's saying to you, mm -hmm. ask someone for advice. Mm -hmm. So what I'm getting from you guys is, it's cancer. The symptoms are lower back pain in, in, in your, the case of your son. Yes. Yours, you had pain in the left nut, if unusual. You get to know your own nuts, your own testicles. You know if something feels a little off, go check, check it, it out, out. Check with it a out. specialist. Okay, right? Spe a urologist. Don't yes. go to, maybe go to your regular doctor, and but Ask for a second opinion. maybe get a second opinion <laughs> urologist. Definitely. Be aware of your body. If you don't understand what it's saying, check it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, your body's, your body's sending you these like divine little whispers that you got to listen to, mm -hmm. and it's it, but it's a skill. It's a skill to be able to listen to your body to hear what it's really asking. So you got to check in. It's just like a relationship. You can't just wait till the person's angry and screaming and slamming doors. It's you got to check in analogy. all the time with the body. Check in with your body. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although I, I must admit uh, I've never had, I never checked my balls. So I don't remember the last time I've did. Maybe it was a couple of years ago when I saw my geologist and I said, you know, something bothered me down there. And man, he grabbed those things. <laughs> and he said, ah, you're okay, which was a relief. Yeah. So I think I'm going to have him check it every year now because I, I see him for my prostate condition. What you could do is you could grab that shower card right there and in about two minutes, you can learn how to do your mm -hmm. own self-exam. And, and really the magic is to do it in the shower when, you're, when your testicles are warm and you're relaxed, because mm -hmm. you're really gonna be able to feel the variation on, on what it feels like. Okay, well, there's the scrotum, there's the testicle, there's a tube that pumps in the top. You're gonna know what your testicles feel like, and if you check in every week, every two weeks, when something happens or there's a change, you will notice the shift in your body. Okay, you have to be your own best advocate when it comes to health care. So uh, we hope to bring more awareness. All right, any, any, any final words? Well, I want to thank you so much. When anybody says they want to honor Sean's memory, it makes me cry. You know, you want, I want him to be remembered. He wanted to do this, and we are getting the word out to young men. And the final words are, check them. <laughs> check them. Check them and come to the running of the balls. <laughs> All right. It's a lot of fun. Yes, right. it's a lot of fun. On that note, check them. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, really. Thank you, Freddie. Thank you. That's wonderful.